So welcome to everyone who is joining us from across Asia Pacific and around the world. It's wonderful to have you all with us. I'm Christine Hayward. I'm the Executive Director of IIC Partners and uh, excited to have this panel put together to talk about the challenges that HR leaders are facing in the region at the moment. And uh, we have a very much an esteemed panel to present to you today. And uh, Bhavashai Sharma of Athena Executive Search and Consulting based out of India is going to be moderating the session today. So with that, Bhavashai, I'll put it over to you. Um, the seminar is now in your safe hands. Thank you, Christine. Well, uh, once again, hello and welcome to all of you for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, I'd first like to thank our panelists who are here to share their valuable perspective with all of us and the participants who have taken their time to be a part of this discussion. Now, uh, many of you would agree that we are witnessing one of the most strange and the most challenging phase of our personal and professional life for the past few months. Uh, COVID-19 has occupied our thoughts more than any other dreaded term before. Now, while some of us have already witnessed quite a few global downturns like the Great Recession, the dot-com bubble burst, and the Gulf War crisis, the current impact of COVID-19 is unlike anyone before because this has, uh, in a lot of ways, changed the fundamentals of human engagement for us and also the way we operate in our personal and our professional spheres. And for instance, our walk from our bedroom to our living room is the new office commute. The group video conferences is the new huddle meeting. And Zoom is the new conference room for all of us. Now, while some of these challenges could end up becoming more effective concepts, but this whole forced disruption of the workspace has led to quite a few challenges as well for the corporate world. Our idea today to host this webinar is to gather thoughts from some of the leading minds, subject matter experts, and eminent HR leaders in the APAC region on how they are getting to address the challenges of this changing world. With that, uh, I'd like to make a very quick introduction to our panel today. And you know, if we can take a lead with Craig. All right, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, very important to take myself off mute. So. Uh... Uh, just uh, quickly, um, my background, uh, I've held uh, senior executive roles, uh, probably um, key areas would be uh, Sintel Optus uh, during their startup, uh, Coca-Cola, Amatol um, for, for a, uh, a long period of time um, working out of uh, Australia and, uh, and then uh, DP World, which is a global stevedoring business. Uh, with about 40,000 employees and I'm currently working for an Australian business called Essential Energy and they're basically a, um, a energy distribution business. Um, as you'll see from the Zoom that uh, I am working from home. Uh, we've, our business has been uh, operating for about three months uh, in this mode and i um, very pleased to be here today. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Sonia, can we have you pitch in? Sure. Thank you so much, Bhavishya. Uh, hello to everyone on the call today. Uh, thank you, Bhavishya, first of all, for having me here. It's a delight to be on this. Uh, I head human resources for Quest Global, which is an engineering service provider uh, with offices across the globe. Um, and quite uh, like Craig shared, you know, this has uh, hit us and almost overnight, we have been on the work from home mode in all our global offices largely. So thank you once again, and great being here. Thank you. Uh, Rajat, can we have a quick introduction from you? Sure, Bhavishya. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone across the globe. Thank you for joining in. Uh, my name is Rajat Bhatia. Uh, I am part of uh, uh, Fair Portal. Fair Portal is uh, in the consumer internet space in the travel domain, one of the hardest hit uh, domains uh, struggling at the moment and fighting. Uh, as a, you know, as my background, I've done various roles in operations and quality uh, and more recently in HR across various organizations like the Matsushita, Dagrob, G, um, Serco, and some Blackstone companies, etc. And more recently over the past almost five years with Fair Portal. Um, I'm part of the people and culture team with Fair Portal. And uh, welcome to everyone. Thanks, Ajay. Uh, Aiko, can we have a quick introduction from you? Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks uh, 
for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today with all of you. My name is Iker. Uh, I'm the HR Director for Corporate Services uh, segment uh, for Sodexo in Asia Pacific. We operate in 12 territories and we have uh, around 70, 75,000 employees in this region. I'm based in Singapore, but I'm Spanish, as you probably noticed uh, in my accent. And I have uh, also worked in, for a few years in the UK, France, and in Italy, so uh, I'm very happy now to be living and working in Asia, and I'm happy to be in this panel also to, to talk with all of you. Thank you so much. Nicole, can we have you? Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is Nicole. I head up the People and Culture team for Disability Services Australia. So we provide disability services in both the employment and the living uh, space. Um, I look after work, health and safety, HR and uh, learning and development. So it's been a fascinating time um, looking after the various aspects of people uh, during, during this um, interesting phase. So really excited to be here and, um, and to share some of those learnings and to learn from all of you as well. Um, I uh, am in an office today for the first time in a very long time. So um, it's been quite uh, surreal to be to be here with fellow um, team members and colleagues. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Paul. Adeline, can we have a very quick introduction from you? Hi, everyone. My name is Adeline. I'm based in Singapore, working with DKSH. We are a Swiss multinational company. We are known for our market expansion services. So we do provide essential services primarily in the fast-moving consumer goods space as well as healthcare. Um, our business is uh, not so much impacted because we are providing essential services, thankfully. However, majority of our workforce who are um, you know, professional levels, we are uh, required to work from home, just like I am today. So I head up the group talent acquisition for DKSH globally. Um, and we have about over 33,000 employees globally in 36 markets. Thank you for having me today. Thanks, Adeline. Linda, can we have a very quick introduction from you? Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good day to everyone. So nice to meet you. I'm Linda Fan from Beijing. I'm the principal of Resources Center Consulting Firm. So I'm currently res uh, responsible for the customized solution relating to people decision and the organization culture, especially committed to help Chinese companies because they're going very fast, uh, setting up their talent management, building competence model, and improving the system of high potential system. My background is much more MNC yeah, in the senior manual role, including uh, like HP and Cisco, uh, UT, Starcom, Hanko, mostly IT and the chemical industries. So nice to meet you guys. Back to you, Bafusha. Thank you, Linda. Thank you everyone for that round of introduction. Um, once again, you know, really appreciate the kind of panel we have today, uh, about the very diverse panel. And uh, we'll now look forward to kind of jump into the agenda and, uh, you know, start off the conversation. Um, Christine, would you help me with the presentation, please? So, uh, the... Yeah, so the first agenda that we want to kind of pick up is uh, what has been the role of HR in managing this current crisis. And uh, I would love to have uh, Craig, maybe probably you, uh, starting that conversation off for us. Yeah, look, in terms of uh, HR's involvement, I think it's uh, been a central, uh, certainly in our organization, it's been a central uh, team uh, effort across the organization. Um, I, I, I will confess uh, that uh, in, in February, uh, so I, I work out of uh, our Sydney uh, uh, business, so um, uh, Sydney, Australia. We um, we started to uh, get reports of COVID nineteen in uh, in February, uh, and at that time, a lot of us thought that uh, this this probably wasn't going to be something that was going to affect us too much. I think uh, we all thought that uh, it'd be uh, contained in uh, in China and. Um, and I remember our uh, risk uh, manager came and saw me and um, 
wanted to do a presentation to our executive uh, about COVID-19 and pandemic, uh, pandemic response. And so we had quite an interesting conversation at that time, uh, just going through, well, you know, is, is this really necessary? You know, as an executive team, we're all very busy. Uh, CEO, is this the, is this the biggest priority uh, on our agenda at the moment? We're implementing a new ERP system and and, and significant number of other uh, initiatives across the business. So um, he convinced me that uh, we should do that in uh, in early February, and within uh, within two or three weeks, uh, the whole scene uh, here in Australia had changed significantly. So uh, from from that point. Uh, we, we put together a, a pandemic response team, uh, of which uh, myself and the risk manager uh, uh, chaired, that, uh, chaired that committee. And we brought in uh, people from uh, operations and uh, uh, finance and all areas of our organization. So I guess like a lot of people on this call, uh, we were learning as we went. Um, we did have, um, through our business continuity uh, team, we have done exercises in pandemic responses previously. Uh, I'm only fairly new to this, to this particular organization, Essential Energy, um, so with only 12 months uh, under my belt with that, with that business. So uh, yeah, I think there was, it's certainly one thing to have a, a uh, pandemic uh, response plan. There's a quite a quite another thing to uh, actually put something in place uh, within the organisation. But in in terms of HR's role, I mean, I could certainly talk a lot more about that. But um, I might just hand back to you, uh, Avisha. No, really. Thank you for your response of that, Craig. Uh, I want to kind of deep dive into this topic further, and you know, I just want to have a little more specific responses from some of our panelists. Uh, Sonia, if I can call upon you uh, and sort of talk to us a little bit more about how the role has changed for you, uh, you know, post-private situation and, uh, you know, what's been the biggest surprise that you have faced in this role due to the pandemic? Um, so, so I think when this started off, Pavishya, right, when, when we first got the inklings that this was kind of uh, crossing boundaries and becoming something that's going to impact us in the various offices that we have, uh, the first impetus that we had as an HR team and as an organization was for, you know, employee health and safety, right? That was the first thing. Uh, that quickly then moved into uh, going into the work from home mode because that became uh, the next need of the hour. Um, and Quest as an organization, we have been, you know, working in offices 99.9%. That's been our way of working. So that quickly changed as well. And then it was to ensure that, you know, business as usual is something that can be uh, kept through and uh, is coming. So while that happened, um, I think, uh, so the biggest uh, surprise for me or, you know, what was really new was the quantity change, okay? Now we've always been as a fraternity talking about a VUCA world and how that's going to be and how we need to be prepared for it. But to me, and I think to a whole lot of us, the VUCA world almost happened overnight, okay? It, it suddenly came in our face. So that was a huge uh, learning and to deal with it. Uh, the other thing I think that was very important was that um, how to do the things that you were normally doing, but in very, very different circumstances and to learn that on the go. Uh, you know, simple things like onboarding employees or offboarding members or doing business was something that we did face to face. That changed very, very quickly uh, and become that everything had to be done remotely, um, mm -hmm. including, you know, having to manage what was a carve out uh, remotely without necessarily being in the same place. So those were things. So I think uh, the biggest learning is that uh, when change happens, the human adapt and to make sure that things can actually happen uh, is, I think, a very pleasant surprise. We've always spoken about it, but to see it happening before your own eyes was fantastic, actually. Right, Bhavishya, over to you. Well, thank you, Sonia. And I think uh, uh, we all appreciate that positive sentiment that comes out from all this is about how you know, we as human community has responded to the whole situation. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, probably uh, moving on to the next aspect of it, uh, you know, especially sort of what if, uh, I would like to call you on that because you look after the global HR operations for Fair Portal 
And as you said, you know, this is one sector which has been quite hugely impacted by the whole situation. Uh, I'm assuming that would have called in uh, for a lot of effective communication with uh, your teams and employees. And I just wanted to kind of get your response in that, how have you managed that part uh, of your job in terms of managing that communication for teams across APAC? And, you know, have we been able to adapt some global policies on all across Asian offices? Sure. Thanks, Bhavisha. So communication, um, I believe, has been one of the most challenging aspects uh, in the current times. And I'm not saying from a logistics standpoint, um, more so what to communicate. And in a situation like ours, uh, where we are obviously, like I mentioned up front, that we, were, we are amongst the hardest hit sectors, uh, the situation is changing by the day, as we all are experiencing across the globe. Um, every day there are new new norms, there are new changes. Um, governments are taking uh, you know decisions on the fly because they also don't know what's going to happen. Um, so in 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 a situation like this, um, obviously our intent has been to be as open, transparent, uh, and communicate as oftenly as possible to our employees. But some of these things have been very very resisting uh, to uh, you know try and kind of share. Uh, what you can or what the employees anticipate. Of course, what we have done is at the best, uh, we've tried to, whenever we've gone ahead and communicated with employees, we've been uh, as open, as transparent, anticipating as many questions. Uh, we've kind of uh, tried to give them as much clarity as we can. Uh, of course, allay some fears to the best of our ability. We've been going ahead and doing a you know, significant number of town halls on a regular basis. Uh, the HR teams have really scaled up, uh, I would say, in uh, taking communication down the most effective ways, uh, you know, were, have been going down one-on-ones, communicating with uh, individuals, um, doing it in smaller groups. So communication has played a very, very crucial role. Um, you know, a lot of the panelists have already talked about it. One, we are not face-to-face -face with our employees, right? What used to be a very, very small percentage globally, even with the best of companies who, who have been operating on a work from home model, there's been a certain percentage that they've been doing. Suddenly you're forced into uh, managing a workforce which is absolutely 100% working from home or not in front of you and um, uh, not exactly prepared. So communication has, be, has been uh, somewhat challenging, but I think, like I said, at least for Fair Portal, I can say the HR teams have really scaled up. They kind of stepped up on it. Uh, we've been communicating as much as possible to individuals, to teams, and at a global level through town halls as leadership, uh, we've kind of got them together. Uh, we've, we've tried to engage with, um, you know, some of the medical experts and done town halls specifically on COVID, right. trying to answer questions, uh, you know, uh, to people or address some of the concerns or about COVID, how to uh, manage some of those things. Um, on the global policies, absolutely. We've been trying to run some standard policies uh, a lot of standard policies uh, we've been trying to drive across the organization, of course, with local flavors added on to it. Uh, but wherever we've been operating, uh, we've, we've tried to do things which are more or less similar across the organization. Back to you, Bhavish. Thank you so much, Rajat. Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, I could, I, if I can uh, sort of call you on, because I know that you kind of lead the HR function across the region uh, for Sodexo. I wanted to sort of pick your thoughts in terms of uh, how have you, what, what have you discovered to be the most effective way to engage with employees, uh, you know, in these current situations and uh, what has been the tools that you have been probably deployed, uh, deploying in terms of having, you know, employees focus on their achieving their objective targets, despite having so much of change, which is happening all around us. Yeah, so we in Sodexo we offer uh, food services and uh, IFM uh, facility management services in our clients' uh, sites. So we have thousands of sites across the region. Uh, so it's very fragmented and decentralized organization. So uh, it is a challenge to communicate with uh, all our employees, and especially in these uh, kind of challenging times. Uh, some of our services are essential services like cleaning, disinfection, uh, maintenance of uh, sites so those have continued uh, to work normally so we have uh, uh, employees still working some others like in food services have been severely impacted by the crisis and have to uh, have to stay at home um, 
in those cases, uh, we still uh, try to well maintain all the benefits, salaries, etc., for those employees. Uh, and we have kept all the communication channels uh, open with all our employees. I think we, uh, as uh, Rajat said earlier, uh, open, being open and transparent is very important in these times of uh, crisis. I think uh, companies that are seen as taking care of their employees, I think, will come stronger. I really believe this will come stronger from this crisis than those that uh, straight straight away start uh, cutting costs and, and uh, laying off employees. Um, so we have tried to always be very open and transparent what is happening. This is probably the biggest crisis that we have all lived in our lives. Uh, and uh, we need to be giving a message of tranquility and calmness, but uh, being aware that there is a big crisis. So we have had plenty of webinars, town halls, and uh, have given the tools uh, like a manager uh, communication guidebook for all our line managers to communicate to their teams and uh, tell them about what was happening. We, we were lucky enough, or lucky, or we had a big presence in China. So China has been, uh, of course, the first uh, affected country here. So then uh, we could learn from, from our experience there to then transfer those experiences to the rest of the region and even the rest of the group. Uh, so the is a French company, so it has a big presence in Europe and the US. Uh, we have more than 400,000 employees worldwide. And they have been looking uh, up on us in Asia Pacific. So it's not that the, uh, as one of the questions there is how the HQ's policies have been affecting APAC. It's been actually the other way around. So I think it has to be global, but decentralized. And you need to, the closer you are to the business and the, the clients, the more you learn. And in this case, our group has learned uh, a lot from the China experience and then the Asia Pacific experience. So they've been looking at us. And then we have plenty of, uh, as I said, webinars manager guidebooks uh, and other direct communication with our employees. I think it's also important in these times to, to make a distinction between clarity and certainty. I think nobody is certain of what's happening. Uh, in this VUCA world, you cannot, the more certain you are, I think you, you, the, the more wrong you will be. Uh, but you can be clear. You can be clear on, on the overall direction and you can give that clarity message to the employees, which I think is very important for them to understand that there are no responses or answers for everything, but at least we have a clear direction, a clear vision of where we want to go and uh, how we can get there, having, of course, some uh, flexibility. No, thank you, Aiko. I think you made an excellent point. I think this is one aspect in which probably the world would look upon to APAC and the playbook would be the APAC playbook, which will probably get implemented across the globe. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, now, I think, you know, probably a, a good way for us to kind of have all our participants uh, also feel engaged uh, in the conversation to maybe run a quick polls to just capture opinions. Uh, so we'd like to just uh, start off one poll uh, at this point in time to capture everyone's thought. Uh, and as you would probably see it on your screens right now, uh, this is about just analyzing how much your role has changed since the pandemic and you have a few options to respond and if we can just have everyone very quickly respond to that. Great. I think, yeah, we have some interesting responses. So we have about 48% odd where the role is just somewhat changed and about 27. So we have about good 70% people who have definitely seen uh, you know, some big significant changes happening in their role. Uh, yeah, I think this is probably uh, a good learning for us to kind of move into our next conversation uh, and we would sort of uh, again sort of dwell a little more deeper into the whole employee engagement aspect of it and uh, you know I feel this is uh, very important because most of the clients that we are engaged with you know have suddenly brought in a lot of focus on this particular aspect of HR and I think this is probably the most in need as well at this point in time so you know we feel that would be great for the panel to kind of respond to that that how the relationship between the employees and the organization has changed significantly in the last few months. 
and uh, you know if we can have uh, probably nicole to start this conversation for us and uh, give us her point of view on this thanks babisha happy to um i think for us it's the um the rules of employee engagement um that that's definitely been um the topic through the last uh, few months but also through how we engage our employees in the various um, concepts, whether they're working from home, whether they're still attending work, if they're an essential uh, service, and in, in our case, attending the homes of um, our customers and assuring them of that safety, their safety and their well-being is still paramount and engaging them in wanting to attend work in what was and what still is an uncertain time around what will what would happen to me. Um, and that really quickly put the spotlight on the leadership at our front line. So our frontline leaders, our direct leaders to those employees has been our con connection and our communication with them from senior leaders to those leaders has been crucial and has overnight really critically improved across all silos and all um, challenges and all, all types of workload to say, how are you supporting your employees? What do you need from the senior leaders? How will you keep them engaged? And what tools and what support do you need to make to make everyone feel safe um, in any context? So in knowing that our engagement channels were they were crucial to stay through the, the normal um, leadership channels, that was that was one big focus. The second focus is really being clear and um, and open about the employee safety and the well-being of our employees and what we're asking them to do if they're still out and about or if they're at home. Um, just those really strict rules around um, how we will look after them, what, what leave we will provide, what allowances we will provide, what does our well-being program look like. We quickly designed one and rolled it out and walked the talk, which I'm very proud of. Um, and again, it has been the, the quick turnaround and the urgency in getting that good quality work um, implemented is definitely not just down to the HR team or the HR function or the crisis team. It's been a true collaboration across all parts of the business in breaking down the silos that ironically we spent so long talking about breaking them down and it took a pandemic to all of a sudden see what a what a true collaboration looks like. So that to echo Sonia's sentiment earlier, that is a positive um, that we've been um, leveraging and harnessing and, and plan to continue on that on that journey. So for us, it's been um, through that leadership through that leadership connection, um, our well-being programs, and and really driving that through. You know, that now is the time for that to shine through a pandemic. And lastly, for me, the third piece to the employee engagement has been delivering the difficult message um, on an individual level and doing that with dignity and with respect, whether it was a, um, a you know, a, a, for example, just relaying a message about um, someone's health conditions would stop them from um, uh, being out and about in their role and therefore we would be asking them to stay home for their own safety and sometimes they don't agree with that because they're so passionate about their roles. So having, there was at times those, you know, the need for those difficult conversations and the tension, um, I, won't, I won't shy away from that, but doing that with respect and dignity and in, on an individual level taking the time in what was a crazy time, just yeah. one way of explaining it, describing it, taking that time for an individual human connection was the third piece and people felt engaged and appreciated. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Nicole. I think that's a very well-structured strategy uh, to manage employee engagement at these times. Um, if I could sort of probably have Sonia uh, come in and uh, you know share with us any new processes or policies which might have emerged from this sudden need that has erupted and if you could share with us any successes from implementing those processes and policies and you know, we all can learn a little bit from that sure thanks thanks Bavisha. um so uh, i think the way i see it is you know um two different ways okay so one is about new policies and processes but uh, 
the biggest thing also has been that existing policies and processes, uh, you can't do it the same way that you've been doing it, right? So there has been uh, tailoring to everything that we've been doing in the past, and there's a new way of doing it today. Um, yeah, like I mentioned before, you know, even if you were welcoming and inducting an employee, it's no longer the way you used to do it. You could welcome them into a room, hand them some company collateral, make them feel special, take them out to lunch. All those things no longer exist, right? Today, it's a very different way of doing it. So actually, the way of doing has changed much um, like we heard Nicole speak, there are things which have come in newly in terms of maybe allowances, in terms of making differences to the way people have been uh, engaged within the organization. Uh, one important thing that has really heightened in um, Quest as well as an organization is the communication piece. Um, many of us spoke about that. I, I think uh, it's about that 10 by 10 by 10 rule that we hear about, right? Uh, you have to repeat the message 10 times. You have to say it in 10 different ways and then hope and pray that at least 10% is retained, right? So communication has been the single most important um, element that we have heightened. We do it in multiple ways um, and uh, we try and do it as clearly as possible in the organization. Uh, the second thing that we have done is about uh, making sure that people are comfortable in the new ways of working to whatever extent. We've adopted technology. I remember earlier where we solicited response, like you did a poll over here. Our open houses have also have this element of, you know, either a mentee poll coming in or some sort of poll. The first thing that you heard was uh, about anxiety. That was the topmost response. So the emotional part of an employee has what has really got amplified during this anxiety about their jobs, anxiety about their health, anxiety about the future. I think that's one thing that we have tried to address and our emphasis on making sure that we have health and safety, especially psychological safety programs uh, getting heightened up is I think one thing that I would like to call up, Abhishya. Sure, sure. Well, thank you, Sonia. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. Um, if uh, I can have uh, Adeline uh, come in for the next question and, uh, you know, and I understand Adeline, you come, you know, with more strong experience that focus towards silent acquisition and I would probably twist this question to kind of look at what are we doing to engage our future employees, you know, as a you know, search firm, we love talking about recruitment somewhere. So I think keeping that objective in mind, if we can kind of uh, learn from you, any challenges that you have faced in terms of looking at engaging with future talent and uh, any strategies that you're developing to overcome those challenges. I think overall, we uh, definitely saw that even though we are providing essential services in the USA, um, you know, we still have the consistent message that let's try not to hire at this point in time if we can. But if we do, it's business critical roles. So we do uh, encourage engaging with the talents continuously. Our recruiters uh, in the various markets continue to you know, do talent mapping, engaging candidates, you know, informally, whoever are in the database. It's a great time now to engage them, you know, clean up the database so that when the timing is right for us to uh, do the search and recruitment again, they, they stay constant, uh, constantly reminded of our brand. So, so those are the strategies that we have put in place and also um, improve our employer branding, taking the opportunity to, you know, shout, shout out more on social media. Great, thank you, Adrian. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Uh, I think we have a question to the panelists and I would like to take it up. Uh, this is from uh, Mr. Natraj. Uh, and I'm gonna read this question so for the rest of the audience can hear this. So Natraj uh, wants to sort of talk about the fact that since uh, there are so many changes which are happening with the you know, whole lockdown and quarantine related uh, guidelines, uh, you know, how do we handle this confusion? and uh, how do we avoid this being transferred to the employees? I, I understand that Raj, your question is coming more from what is happening in India, but I think in a uh, lot, lot of parts of the world, this, this confusion is still there. So, you know, if anyone from the panel can respond to that, uh, if you have faced that challenge before. Um, Babish, I can, I can go ahead and sure. try and respond to that. Sure. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been as an organization and a lot of the other organizations similar to us um, 
have not been in a work from home model at all, literally. Um, at least I would say that we've been the least uh, on work from home uh, and with a whole lot of um, contact centers supporting global setups, etc. Uh, we've been kind of operating uh, from the office premises mostly. Having said that, um, now the recent situations, especially in, in India, that's been fairly changing significantly. Uh, it has definitely been a challenge. Um, I think the only way, you know, we've, what we've been trying to do with our employees is continuously kind of go back to them, um, try and, like I said earlier, uh, and, and some of the points that I made, that we've been trying to allay their fears. We've been trying to give them as much clarity as we have right now, uh, trying to help them overcome. I think it's coming from significant amount of anxiety people have, significant amount of uh, uncertainty people have, and uh, which is which is uh, obviously. Um, um, you know, expected because the situation is changing. But I think what we're trying to do is um, as much as possible, uh, trying to give them at least, I can't say it's a mid to long term uh, clarity you can give, but as much as possible, extend the short term uh, kind of uh, continuity uh, or consistency we can give them. So we've been trying to tell them, you know, over the next couple of weeks, this is what we're trying to focus on and this is what how things are going to pan out. Um, you know, so they, they at least... Are, are familiar. The other thing is that, you know, at, as much as possible, if there's been a change in sudden situation, then we try and uh, let them know what that change has been uh, because the government policies also have changed, um, you know, over a period of time. There's no right or wrong way. There's no one standard way to approach this. I think it will be very, very situational. But I would say that, you know, to, to our earlier point, it's, it's all about trying to communicate. I think that's a challenge we've also been learning because wherever we've seen that that communication has has missed in certain areas and which is very very uh, normal because in this right. circumstances when you don't have your employees in front of you a lot of cases you you just assume that you forget to communicate or you don't think it's as important but those right. small things could impact your employees very very significantly and that yeah. could create a lot of confusion amongst the employees mind so i i would say that that that's the best way you could sure. manage it right now Thank you. Thanks for responding to that, Rajat. Uh, I think, you know, um, we'd like to sort of go into another poll, which is it's connected to this topic about how the whole work from home is coming you know, along for all of us. And uh, we'd love to kind of pick uh, the, you know, all the participants' views on it. And I would encourage if you're responding to this either as an employee or if you are heading in an organization as an HR, you could be responding to this as your opinion about the entire workforce. I think we're getting friends of what we anticipated this to be. This is how most of the reports are also coming in. Uh, most studies are reflecting something similar that most of the employees are actually talking about. Yeah, so we have about 50% of the employees talking about having an increased productivity, less than 15% to talk about a decreased productivity. I think this is something in line with what we would have anticipated. Great. Um, so, you know, I think with that, we probably would love to uh, move to our third uh, topic that we want to discuss with everyone today. Uh, and, uh, you know, Rajat, maybe, uh, you know, I would like to call you back in for this because I think we've talked about in the past about the focus on, uh, you know, l and uh, that you have. Uh, and this whole shift probably, you know, has impacted certain channels very, very, you know, deep. I think, you know, LND is a channel where we have always worked with an impersonal and, you know, a physical model of uh, transmission. So uh, how that shift has come in wrong, how you are adapting to that, uh, are you kind of making some customization to the entire LND strategy in order to suit the current situation? Yeah. Um, so um, I think LND has always been an area of uh, focus for organizations, but 
in the current situation, LND definitely has has uh, uh, taken a, a very very crucial role. Um, there's a lot of focus on learning and development, not just from the organization side, also from the employee side. I think the employees are also keen. Uh, maybe it's also partly that there's nothing better to do right now. A lot of people want to learn and enhance new skills. Suddenly they feel the importance of uh, learning and development uh, because earlier people were so engaged in, in their day-to-day -day work and running mm -hmm. for work. I think when they've got time to sit back and, and think through. Mm -hmm. So as an organization, I think we're putting a lot of focus on, on learning and development. Of course, it has required significant change. Um, you know, there's been a, a, a lot of uh, focus from, uh, I think the um, instructor-led modules to a lot more self-learning or guided uh, learning structures. As an organization, uh, we've kind of um, suddenly kind of, we've enhanced our strategy to use learning platforms a lot more effectively, uh, going out and reaching to people, uh, trying to create a lot more self-learning, uh, self-paced training modules. Uh, of course, the LND team has been supporting that, has been guiding that uh, through and through, but uh, this has also been a good time, but one of the things that is significantly there, and I know one of the questions you have that, and I have, uh, my thought is, at least for us, it's not been so much a change in the technical and functional skills that have required too much of training. I think the focus has been on the soft skills. That is where the significant change uh, or focus is required uh, because nobody was prepared for a situation like this and to manage a workforce which has been completely remote, um, you know, and in this changing environment. So that's been a significant focus for us from an LED standpoint, apart from, you know, your regular technical and functional trainings. Back to you, Bhavish. Thanks, thanks for just, thanks for sharing your thoughts. <clears throat> uh, Linda, can I have you kind of uh, share some thoughts, uh, the, you know, about the new work, work environment uh, that has sort of triggered a shift in the skill requisites in your sector, and if you can also talk about how your L&D team is managing that shift. Yeah, I'd like to share something, uh, especially regarding from China. Uh, if you look at the, the crisis, we can see this really great opportunity to the to see companies. They transfer their business from offline to online. So that means the online covers all aspects of our life, not only limiting to like daily shopping, like food and beverage or catering, but also expanding, expanding such as, for example, seeing uh, doctors at home, even some famous doctor at home, and also buying furniture, uh, expensive furniture, uh, uh, because some uh, is, uh, furniture shops pre-sale with discount, and people even look at house online. So this kind of business, uh, is transferred really from on, uh, offline to online. So what uh, the, the employees and the management team can consider the real solution for the competence improvement. Another interesting pheno uh, phenomenon happened in China is FMB, food and beverage and FMCG industry, because some of them have stores and the restaurants. There were no business in February and March. And they had to think about selling online, try to sell and it was success, but it happened successful as soon as sold out. So of course they use a lot of TikTok or living stream uh, online promotion. Yeah. So uh, for sure, this is a quite China situation and our specialty. But from this, we can see how online is very important, especially this enable uh, the people to learn how to telecommuting practice, yeah, uh, and also to learn how to improve the online skill, yeah. For example, we need to use the tools of Zoom and Tencent, uh, 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 Tencent uh, tele uh, telecommunication system, yeah. And also, uh, we need to think about how to improve the online business capability. So this is the most companies will spend the most uh, effort uh, on this, yeah. No, thanks, thanks, Linda. And I think this is uh, an important point that you make. And I think the biggest shift that we're talking in a lot of ways is about things moving to a digital platform, you know, whether it's in terms of business model or in terms of the modules that the HR is running as a function. And, uh, you know, just in continuation to that thought, uh, you know, uh, Ikur, if I could have you come in and talk in a little bit more about if the L&D function by itself has 
seen any bit of a digital transformation uh, triggered by the whole pandemic situation and uh, or, or are there any changes in the whole LD system than pre covid and post covid situation if you can share your thoughts on that yeah definitely uh, i think uh, the when well, sodexo we had the a digital transformation process or project uh, going on for a few years already but i think the covid-19 crisis has accelerated that everywhere and that's been also the case in in our case we were already using e learning micro learning apps for uh, frontline employees for some of the tasks they are doing but uh, we accelerated that and we have been using that even more and for uh, all the employees working from home so we have been also offering uh, some of the webinars were about uh, content of job, but others were about new skills, uh, about cooking, about different things to keep that engagement. Uh, so we have been working a lot on that. Then so learning and development, I think one thing is the digital platforms you can use, but at the end, how you develop and learn is the most effective way to learn is to do, you know, and to, to, to you learn in the job. So I think we need to still uh, enable people learning from others, having coaching, mentoring, even if it's remotely. Uh, so it's not just about having an e-learning platform and that's it. It's about combining all that in a, in a in a blended learning approach in which people can learn on the job, can shadow other uh, more senior staff, uh, have uh, mentoring uh, and coaching. And in that we have continued working that, but of course doing that remotely. Uh, I think I'm a, I'm a certified coach myself and I've been doing some coaching also remotely. And I think it's not the same as doing it face to face because you don't see the, 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 the full body language of the person. Right. But still, I think it's a good substitute. Uh, and we need to continue working that. So I think uh, my message here is that uh, we often are a bit blinded by talking about technology, but at the end, technology is an enabler. And we need to continue uh, giving the tools to, to people to learn and develop. And it's not, uh, technology is another enable that allows us to, to reach to people that are uh, at home, et cetera. But we will continue, we need to continue working in other aspects and giving them experience, uh, different projects, uh, mentors, et cetera. Becca. Thanks, back to you, Babisha. Thanks, thanks, Aikar. I think that was really helpful to get your thoughts on that. Um, see, I, I actually had a poll planned at this phase, but I think I'm also pragmatic about the time that we have. And I know some of you have very hard uh, timelines to follow. So we're going to jump, jump straight to the next topic because I think uh, we would uh, like to get some thoughts on uh, the whole impact of uh, executive mobility, uh, you know, in the organization. I think, you know, one of the key significant factors that we, you know, we are all uh, suffering is not able to travel. And I think that's impacted the mobility of talent across borders. And I wanted to kind of just get a uh, little perspective, uh, you know, in terms of understanding, you know, how that is playing a role uh, in the current dynamics of the organization. And if I can have probably Linda, uh, you know, sort of start this conversation and, you know, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, if you are, might deploy and mobilize talent to areas of business that need more resources uh, because of the whole impact and where have you needed to make any resource adjustments in the past? And, if you can all respond to that. Uh, Linda, I was directing this to you. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I think note that this crisis is the biggest black swing event in the past 50 years. So uh, for sure the business economy impact huge. And even right now, nobody can predict what will happen yet and also the consequence. Like Sony said, you know, we're HR, before we always talk about WUCA, but, but not, did not feel close yeah, to WUCA, just talk. So now every, every of us is uh, witnessing and involved and living in these WUCA times, right? So uh, that means, you know, all the companies, if they want to be successful, need to pay attention. I think the first way the respond you know, response to the, the changes. It's not easy. And the second is speed, how quick. How we approved regarding this, uh, requested by my client in February and March. This is a China A uh, company for medical uh, enterprises and the annual sales volume is about 3 billion RMB. 
So uh, we requested this project uh, at the beginning of our break uh, by the founder. By the founder, they request us to evaluate how efficient about their organization agility, uh, agility for their executive team. Because he thinks if executive level cannot be agile, it's difficult for others, uh, other people, including whole organization. Actually, this is very, uh, uh, we, we say, is a very regular assessment, but not many companies consider to do it during regular time. So we help them to work out during worker time, uh, uh, current uncertainty and ambiguity economic session, and the fund uh, who are the people strong in agile leadership. Yeah. and ability of managing crisis and the sharp insight capability. Because looking back uh, uh, this three and four months is, is a big examination of us. Yeah. So especially for the top management, we need to help them to see what their agility and how the whole agility uh, level We help this company to clear understanding who are the people have a strong skill facing challenges, facing changes and encourage changes. Because right now you can see uh, last uh, two and three days, Beijing has a little bit uh, amidst a raising cases right. in Beijing. Right. Yeah. So you never know what happened tomorrow. So yeah. these outbreaks, we think, is a good time for them to review and evaluate uh, how uh, the leadership team is NGO or not NGO. So we call it each NGO leadership, yeah, to achieve their uncertainty, yeah. Uh, so this is a case uh, we currently already completed in three weeks, and now we are following up with this client their new request, how to manage the, the, the real solution about their uh, ambiguity and the most important issues because this ambiguity is no clear solution. Sure. So for the sure. next level, follow up. Got it, got it. Thank, thank, you you. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for your response. Um, you know, I think, yeah, uh, you know, as, as search organization, you know, I think we, we all are witnessing one very interesting trend, uh, which is coming up, uh, especially post uh, pandemic is that actually people are reluctant to take new assignments. And uh, this has been a challenge that, you know, all, all, all my peers and partners have been you know, experiencing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where probably I wanted to bring in a subject matter expert like Adeline and sort of uh, talk to us about her experience uh, as, as a TA head of, uh, you know, what has been, you know, these, uh, you know, reservations that you have witnessed, uh, you know, especially post pandemic and, you know, uh, what, what might could be the, you know, solution to sort of resolve that because of the restriction in travel and relocation. Yeah, so we do a lot of uh, hiring of uh, senior executives and mm -hmm. talents can be from coming from anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it is true that when we reach out to candidates, particularly maybe um, because of our business operations being very big in Asia, if we do uh, reach out to candidates who are maybe out of this region, from mm -hmm. Europe, from USA, I do mm -hmm. see that the reluctance uh, level is higher in general mm -hmm. to take assignments in, in, um, in places like Asia. Um, we can do as much as providing you know, assurances about how the organization, how HR plays a very important role in helping mm -hmm. them to, uh, you, you know, get over the barriers of um, to, to ensure their safety, that's sure. number one. Yeah, and when only when it is safe for them to travel, then they, you know, they they need to come on board. But um, they can even start doing the work uh, right. where they are. Um, it's it's no, you know, it's not uh, necessarily that we must have them on board right now. So these are the mm -hmm. assurances to potential candidates to to help mm -hmm. them, to, you know, what all the organization is doing um, mm -hmm. to, to get them on board. Um, within the organization, we do have a lot of in, internal um, assign, assignments that's going on. These are assignments that were already confirmed, you know, like three months, four months, even six months ahead. Mm -hmm. And the current situation, you know, um, we have many of our colleagues who are stranded wherever they are. Even new can, uh, employees who are hired 
who are currently based in Singapore, you know, they're supposed to start in Thailand, they can't return. So, but it doesn't, doesn't, we haven't stopped them from starting their job on time. So what we have really encouraged is to ensure and enable them to have the technology tool and the access to whatever they need to get started. And ensure that we a lot more um, orientation, you know, with who are the key stakeholders they need to have, you know, a video airtime with um, to get them, uh, you know, up to speed. Just as if, you know, uh, it's not the same as before. It's not face to face, but we do, we do what we can to the maximum to help them to onboard, uh, you know, on time uh, to help them to have the, the technology and the tools that they need to get their job done. So we are seeing that uh, internally, the reluctance rate is a lot lower because they're already familiar with the organization. But true enough, when we talk about external talent attraction, there is a level of reluctance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your thoughts, Adelin, on this. Um, you know, uh, the next one is actually an open question to all the panelists and, you know, uh, as well as so all the participants. So we start a quick poll. And as you know, our participants are responding to this question, if we can have any of the panelists, you know, this is just a, I think everyone's guess is as good on this aspect of it. But when do we potentially see, you know, business travel making a return in the region? And we spe specifically talking about Asia Pacific right now. So any one of you who wants to take that question. So, Bhavisha, I, I mean, on the business travel, uh, see, there are organizations which, uh, you know, definitely have a significant requirement for business travel. Mm -hmm. uh, one, even those organizations today uh, mm -hmm. are, um, you know, are kind of questioning um, the whole model of right. to what extent, but of course, which are very, very, high intensive client facing, um, which may need uh, to a significant extent need the business travel. You know, you'll have to bifurcate these in, in the kind of need from, I guess from now on till definitely till the end of the year, mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to bifurcate this in organizations which, may, which definitely thrived on a lot of business travel because they had a lot of client facing or there was a requirement. And those organizations, we would see still see some business travel coming back, uh, right. being in the travel sec sector, not so much business, but yeah, we're seeing, you know, some people are kind of being um, a bit optimistic and trying to plan a couple of months from now. Right. Um, so you will start to see some amount of that coming in over the mm -hmm. next maybe uh, 30, 16 uh, days Right. in, in uh, some bits and pieces right. uh, organizations where the, the business travel itself was limited. I think they will uh, be far more hesitant because they right. can do without it. And even the organizations that need business travel, because you keep in mind that it's not just about allowing the business travel. It's mm. also about the risk um, that, um, you know, the organization will be thinking from an employee health and safety Right. Um, as HR, if you ask me, would you want people to travel right now? I would say no, because that kind of exposes my people uh, to a higher risk. Right. And when they come back or move into offices, that could be a higher exposure. Right. So one is, of course, you know, at least uh, in the India context, we would probably and in a lot of other areas. I mean, if you look at US, US is opening up for, right. you know, in a lot of states. Um, uh, but um, there'll be some amount of uh, business travel that will happen, mm -hmm. uh, but not not to the same extent, I think, right. um, you know, again, it's a guess, but I would say it may go at best 30 to 40% to pre COVID levels by end of the year. Yeah. No, I think that we're getting the similar kind of response from the poll as well, that we're anticipating about six to 12 months is where most people are anticipating things to be back to some level of normalcy. As you said, we don't anticipate this to be fully normal, but to have some level of normalcy. Good. So I think we're going to quickly dive into the last uh, aspect of, uh, you know, our <clears throat> discussion today. And, uh, you know, if uh, I, I can have, you know, maybe Craig back, come back into this conversation and, you know, just again, share with us, you know, if this whole, you know, sudden learning or forced learning that we've had due to this pandemic has triggered any bit of a, you know, 
risk mitigation planning, any kind of uh, future secure planning uh, to handle similar situations uh, coming up uh, and if there's been any development of strategies in that direction, if you can share some thoughts on that, Craig. If you don't mind, I might come at this a slightly different way rather than on the mis risk mitigation sort of uh, cover off in terms of uh, organisational culture and uh, employee engagement, etc. I mean, it's a, a, our executive team has spent some time sort of thinking about um, what the future will look like post COVID. And because a lot of organisations or some organisations may really squander a great opportunity that, uh, that, that that's presented at the moment. I mean, it's, it's obviously a tragic situation um, in many countries, but uh, in some ways, uh, the way that organisations and people have shifted from uh, work, um, you know, the, the, the traditional sort of at your desk work environment to the working from home environment, it's almost, it's almost taken us forward a whole decade in a matter of three months. Um, you know, in, in 2020, if we had just, uh, if life had continued as, as it has been, it would probably would have taken us to 2030 before we would have had some of the opportunity and see some of the, the, the degree of change uh, that we're seeing in, around the globe right now. So, right. so for us, we're, we're turning our mind um, significantly to how do, we, how do we create a more flexible uh, work environment for employees? How do we, in the past, employees would come to ask and request for could they have more flexibility? Could they work from home? Our policies and procedures were set around those sorts of, uh, those parameters. Uh, whereas, whereas now we're looking to turn that around and say, well, um, and I know some organisations have been uh, quite uh, contemporary and, and quite advanced in this area. Others haven't. Uh, I guess our organisation probably sits in the middle. So uh, that opportunity for employees to come forward and, and look for greater workplace flexibility uh, and then for the organisation to think about, well, you know, it's a bit difficult now to say, well, I'm not sure that that role could be done at home because uh, there's many roles that may, that may have happened in the past. So, so for us, that's um, that's the opportunity that we're we're looking at in terms of uh, forward planning. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been fairly fortunate on the technology front. Um, maybe if this um, pandemic had have come along three years ago, we would have been in a lot more trouble as an organization we've, we've we've taken a lot of our systems to the cloud so it uh it has created the technology uh opportunity for us to be able to do things differently as a business um i've had we've, we've run surveys in our own organization and had feedback from employees and we've got you know in some areas we've got you know 40 to 60 percent of employees saying that they would like um to continue with uh, greater levels of flexibility um in a way that that they've been experiencing today. So I was very surprised at that high number. Um, and even in, my, even in my own leadership, um, HR leadership team, uh, we've had a conversation about it. And, and one of the members of my team said to me, look, Craig, I, I really hope that as a result of uh, what's happened and the way that we work, that when we actually do, um, when we do come back into a more normal sort of work environment that I'm that I'm, I'm not coming into the office to stand in front of a screen um, that the reasons I come into the office is to collaborate yeah. is to uh, engage to be to participate in particular activities um, because I think it's I think we've been able to show that we can we can work uh, in front of a screen anywhere um, cool. so for us from a policy procedure from a from a culture from an engagement from a values point of view Mm -hmm. um, I really think they're, they're the areas uh, that are creating um, great, the greatest opportunities for, for us and probably a lot of other organisations. And I think the ones that don't see this as a, as a, uh, a catalyst of change, um, you know, I think, they will, I think they may struggle in attracting talent in future because I think uh, those organisations that really grasp this and take it forward um, we'll have a greater track strategy in terms of uh, that, that workplace flexibility and the way things happen. So. Yeah. No, thanks, Ray. I think that's, that's uh, very insightful. And uh, yeah, I think I somewhere conquer to the thought that, you know, this is, this is the time to change and all organizations yeah. 
have to take this opportunity to sort of bring about these changes. Um, I'm going to combine the next uh, questions. I'm going to take it to Sonia, but then I'm going to sort of probably open it up to all the panelists because I think this is where we want to sort of part some, uh, you know, knowledge transfer to all our, you know, participants today. If we can share, you know, some bit of our learnings uh, from this whole situation, and if we can sort of offer some bit of an advice to all the leaders which are participating on the call with us today. Sonia, if you can start with it, and we're going to start have a more free flow conversation after that. Sure. Um, so very interesting question, right? Uh, about what are the learnings? Uh, so I think what I have learned personally, and which I think make will make sense to a majority of people who are on this call or others, uh, is A, I think it's very important to unlearn Bhavishya, okay? I think uh, a, a lot of us have been doing things in a certain way, have been used to doing and seeing things in a certain way. The unlearning is very important for your, us to work through any pandemic uh, or any situation which is, you know, kind of uh, unpredictable. Uh, the second point is, um, when this uh, when this pandemic started, my CEO asked, you know, uh, how many of us have actually been through this exact same situation? Okay, so as to actually design or go through and plan uh, what needs to be done. And uh, Quest as an organization has always been growing, growing, and growing. None of us have seen this standstill coming. So mm -hmm. experience is not there. But I think what we all can actually be very proud of is that we've had the opportunity to learn so much during this entire phase. Right. Uh, and this we will appreciate, I think, when we look back at some point in time, because what we have to achieve, what we've been able to do under so much of uncertainty is something that will stand with us in good stead for years to come. And I do hope we don't have another pandemic to deal with, uh, but definitely the learnings are something that we could use. So I'll stop sure. with that and let sure. others take a shot. Sure, sure. I'll jump in if that's all right. Thank you, yeah. Sonia, for that. Absolutely agree with with um, all of it. I think another learning for us has been um, what critical functions continued through the pandemic and what will continue, but also just in terms of that same vein of the unlearning. There is a learning for an opportunity coming our way soon to, to discuss as an executive team what activities we need to stop or what has stopped during the pandemic that we need to recommence, but with a completely different lens and a completely different approach. And um, the, the, the last one that I'm quite excited about is the learnings from what, what are we going to leverage from a technology point of view? Um, things, quick innovative solutions that we put in place for Band-Aid solutions for the pandemic, maybe they are could they stay as permanent solutions? Do we need to undo them when we go back to some kind of normal, whatever that is? Um, that, and that's a really important discussion for our HR team. What's been the, the need for fast tracking of some innovations? What stays with us and what, and what do we um, let go of? Thanks, guys. Yeah. So, Bavisha, let me add in. Um, I think for one, uh, if we go back, uh, you know, we look at it and more from a learning standpoint, our preparedness to deal with such a, a crisis, I would say most organizations, but I'll restrict to ours for sure, um, has been, um, you know, pretty limited. Mm -hmm. Nobody anticipated it, you know, with all the BCP uh, functions uh, across the organization. I think nobody went beyond to think something like this will happen, right? right? Um, so uh, that, that obviously uh, kind of, uh, taught us that, um, you know, there's been limitations in our preparedness because we don't think beyond uh, a certain what we think or what we assume is going to happen. Mm -hmm. The second piece, uh, which has been a good learning, is our ad ability to adapt in such a changing situation and crisis and the response mm -hmm. uh, of people and organizations, most organizations, has been very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig pointed this out that, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is probably a catalyst for change for most organizations. Those who would not would struggle uh, in the near future, definitely. Um, the third thing I think from uh, going back to the whole fabric of the organization, uh, mm -hmm. the, the leadership, uh, you know, uh, this is a big learning because you, you have to look at your leaders with a very, very different lens at this moment. Uh, I think it's, it's about, um, you know, the, the expectation from leaders will change mm -hmm. uh, a lot more. We've been talking about it more academically that leaders need to be more 
adaptable, they need to be open to change. But this situation has actually kind of triggered that. Right. Um, going forward, you would need leaders and each one on the call uh, that is there and you know, everyone needs to understand that if you're not adaptable to change, if you're not willing to imbibe uh, changing uh, structures, requirements, automations, technology, um, it's going to become very difficult because a lot of things which we assumed could not happen uh, have obviously taken shape. Uh, uh, you know, uh, on a lighter note, I think one good thing that has happened is uh, that uh, it's made the employees feel the importance of the organization. They seem to be missing the organization suddenly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, um, but uh, having said that, I think, yes, it's, it's got to be a lot of lessons that have come out of it. Uh, and like Sonia mentioned, hopefully we don't see this, but um, I can tell you in our organization, we're very clear. We're def trying to design or define a model or an operating model or a strategy, mm -hmm. which actually now is aligned to cater to any kind of situations like this in the future. And I'm sure yeah. most organizations are doing that. So the sure. entire thought process has changed uh, with this. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Rajat. Uh, Iker, if we can have some uh, thoughts from you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I read uh, recently some research saying that the, in uh, when times of crisis, our brain is more open to, to big changes. It's more open. It's like uh, we are more open to press the reset button. And I think this crisis is a, a big opportunity to, to change. And I think we all are, are a bit uh, afraid, anxious, but also hopeful. Uh, that things uh, will get better because uh, I think in many areas and not only in, in business but in the society as a whole I think there are many things that can be improved and, and I think they will and we are I think uh, we can see that that can be improved. I uh, mean at least I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. So I think that crisis has given us that, uh, that there the is opportunity to change. I think I realize that we human beings are more adaptable than uh, what we thought. I didn't think, I live alone, uh, I'm single, so I didn't think I will be able to survive almost three months staying at home and not uh, physically seeing anybody, only through seeing people through Zoom. But I have survived and it hasn't been too bad actually, so I have uh, reflected a lot, it's been a, a good time for thinking, etc. So we adapt to the realities we have and we, uh, and we come forward. So I think it's the, the good learning and organization need to be more agile and adaptable in the new reality. And I think we are all realizing that, that, that those that don't change rapidly, they, they won't survive. And I think uh, also we realized that the uh, working from home is here to stay. I think uh, people will want to have more flexibility in the way they, they work. I don't think it will be 100% working from home. As I said, I survived these three months, but I'm really looking forward to meeting my colleagues in the, in the office and having some social time. But I think the time we will be more flexible and we will be working those who, of us who can will be more, working more often from home yeah. um, but also will cherish the times that we can go to the office and, and the office time will be I think more time for social interaction team team building team meetings more creative uh, aspects of our job so we we have to change also our office spaces mm -hmm. uh, and workplace design and workplace strategy will will be more and more important to improve the employee experience um, and then I think as we work more and more from home, the, the so-called war for talent will actually become a global war for talent because now uh, uh, location won't be so important. So at the end, uh, people, if you can work remotely, you can hire someone in Mumbai or Singapore yeah. or China. So I think that's an important uh, consequence of also of this crisis. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Victor. Uh, Adeline, Linda, if any of you have any you know, thoughts to share with the, all our participants. Uh, yes, I I like to echo Iker's comment, and I use the, the, the Churchill's word, yeah, sentence, never with a good crisis. Yeah. And uh, I totally agree with Iker. Uh, after crisis, we, for sure, we need to change. And we may think differently you know, from our value, from our vision, uh, even from a goal. So I really hope we all grow deeper, yeah, during the crisis and sure. also may and bless the storm pass soon. Sure, absolutely. Amen to that. Uh, Adeline, can we have your thoughts? Yes, thank you. I totally echo with uh, the earlier panelists, you know, 
Um, I think the key thing that we really have to learn from this is to be agile, to be very flexible and ready to change. Nobody had, uh, no organization is actually prepared for COVID-19, but uh, we all learn, we all adapt as we move along. I think this is the most important skill uh, that we cannot do without. And as for, from an organization point of view, I think it's important that uh, leaders, you know, stay open, have an open mindset to what needs to be changed. I totally agree that, you know, it's, uh, it's proven that working from home is possible. Um, you know, who would have thought that talent acquisition can be done 100% without a face-to-face -face interview? Uh, we do that now uh, across all the markets and, you know, people, people are even asking during interviews if working from home can be possible. Uh, as part of their employee benefits, or is that something the company practice moving forward? So yeah. I think within our organizations, I'm seeing this shift in the leaders' thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. We are making progress which wouldn't have been possible at all, absolutely out of question, if not for right. COVID. Yeah, sure. so sure. that's really, yeah, great news Thanks. for everyone. Thanks, Adeline. Thank you so much for your thoughts. No, I think... Uh, just to echo that uh, sentiment, I mean, things definitely have changed for all of us. I mean, we at ISC Partners, uh, we would have these HR roundtable conferences twice a year during our global conferences. And we were so used to having these conversations face to face with, you know, the likes of you. And, you know, now this is the new normal where we are sort of, you know, moved to or rather graduated to doing this online digitally. And uh, yeah, I think we were all getting used to this new way and uh, learnings from this. Um, I'm, I'm very, very pragmatic of the time that, uh, you know, we are, I think, short by 15 minutes. And I know that all of you have, uh, you know, some engagements to follow through with that. I just wanted to give just one last minute to any burning question that any of our participants might have, if uh, they would like to shoot that right away and if we can take it. Uh, but uh, yes, I, you know, we'll try to keep it for the next couple of minutes only. No, I think we have anyways addressed a lot of questions during this. Uh, yeah, we have so one question. Yeah, I think yeah, that's that's true, Natraj. I think I can respond on behalf of panelists for that. Yeah, that is going to be that is going to be the case. Well, uh, I think uh, I'll probably I'll probably call. Uh, the end of this, uh, you know, meeting discussion today, uh, keeping in mind the time that we have in hand. I'll again like to thank all of you so much. We are privileged to have uh, this kind of panel with us today. Thank you so much for your thoughts that you've shared, the wonderful ideas you've shared, the experiences that you've shared from this. And I think that has led to a lot of learning for all of us, the entire panel, as well as all the participants. I look forward to seeing you all in person someday soon, but uh, definitely over a webinar, uh, definitely sometime sooner than that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank for you so share. much for your time. Thank you All so right. much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, bye -bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you, bye bye. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.